So there aren't a lot of guarantees in the criminal justice system, but for a long time now, there's been at least one thing you could be pretty sure of, which is that if you kill somebody in self-defense, there's a very good chance in this country you're going to be charged with murder. Trayvon Martin called George Zimmerman a cracker right before pounding his head into the pavement, and famously, the entire country, including the President of the United States at the time, determined immediately that George Zimmerman was the bad guy. And of course, Kyle Rittenhouse was nearly, uh, near, very nearly had to spend the rest of his life in prison for the crime of defending himself against several people who were clearly trying to kill him, including a pedophile who just got out of a mental hospital and an Antifa foot soldier who drew a handgun on him. Now, everyone's heard of these cases because in both instances, there was a very clear racial angle to push. Now, even though he didn't kill any black people, the Kyle Rittenhouse incident happened, of course, in the context of BLM mobs torching cities. So they had that angle, and, and that's why he became an instant target. George Zimmerman, for his part, gave Barack Obama a chance to talk about how systemically racist America is, so his case was useful uh, for a moment as well. But there are many self-defense cases that don't make the mainstream news, at least not nearly to the same extent. And all of them, to one degree or another, contradict the prevailing media narrative, so the corporate press ignores them. But they're important to talk about, in part because they show how prosecutors and witnesses are willing to lie to imprison people who exercise one of the most fundamental rights— you might say the most fundamental, which is the right of self-defense. How casually they will destroy people's lives for the crime of trying to preserve their own lives. So I'm going to go in-depth into one of uh, these cases, which is, which is still ongoing. Hasn't gotten nearly as much attention as it deserves. And plus, it's the premiere day for judge. So I, I, you know, I figure a deep dive on a court case seems sort of fitting. So uh, here's the background. In the summer of 2022, a man in his early 50s named Nikolai Mu was out tubing with a group of people, including his wife. And this was in the Apple River in Wisconsin. Now, apparently, a, a member of his party uh, dropped their phone somewhere in the river, and Nikolai Mu left his group and went looking for the phone. And that's when, around 3.40 p.m., Mu encountered a couple of additional tubing groups, one consisting of a bunch of teenagers and the other including some adults. And most of the involved parties are uh, very clearly under the influence of alcohol and perhaps other drugs to varying degrees, and they begin exchanging some words, and here's what happened next. Watch. Who is this? Yes! Yes! yes. yes. From the, from the culture! From the culture! Who is that? From the culture! Who is that? Who the hell is this? Now, it's clear uh, from this footage that throughout the entire incident, right up until their friend got stabbed, the crowd of teenagers doesn't seem to be afraid of anything or feel fearful for their lives in any way. And, uh, and they seem to be having a great time. And, and, you know, that makes sense because Mu is much older than they are. And though they wouldn't have known this, he just had quadruple bypass surgery. So he wasn't out looking for, you know, a fight with a bunch of teenagers. Meanwhile, these teenagers are mostly football players in prime physical condition. So they appear to be uh, very much the aggressors as they jeer and taunt the older man and accuse him of, quote, looking for a little girl. And then something happens off camera. An adult woman who came over from another tubing group gets in the man's face he apparently makes some kind of contact with her, and the mob pounces. They push the man and begin hitting him repeatedly after he goes down in the water. And meanwhile, the woman is, is fine. She's not hurt in any way. Only after the man fatally stabs one of his attackers, it's a, a teenager named Isaac Schumann, does the mood start to change. Schumann bled out on the scene. 
the man also stabbed several others who were attacking him. And you can tell from watching the video that they that you know he was not chasing them down and, and slicing away, that they were coming at him, attacking him. And that's when he used the knife. Now, based on these facts, within 48 hours, the DA charged Nikolai Mu with first-degree murder. And what's followed nearly two years later is, for the prosecutors anyway, nothing short of a train wreck. You know, there are airtight cases, and there are close cases, and then there's this. Pretty much every prosecution witness has demonstrated very clearly that they're either lying or they're completely unsure of what happened two years ago. And this is such a debacle that very real questions need to be asked about why this case was brought and why these prosecutors still have jobs. Balance of Nature Fruits and Veggies is the most convenient way to get whole fruits and vegetables every day. They use an advanced cold vacuum process that encapsulates fruits and vegetables into whole food supplements without sacrificing their natural antioxidants. The capsules are completely void of additives, fillers, extracts, synthetics, pesticides, or added sugar. The only thing in Balance of Nature's fruits and veggie capsules are fruits and veggies. Imagine trying to eat 31 different fruits and vegetables every day. That sounds miserable and time-consuming. Well, with Balance of Nature... There's never been an easier way to ensure that you get your daily dose of fruits and vegetables. Go to balanceofnature.com and use promo code Walsh to get 35% off your first set of fruits and veggies and an additional $10 off every additional set that you buy. That's balanceofnature.com, promo code Walsh. So I'll start with the incredible testimony of a witness named Larion Davis, who recorded some of the footage of the incident. Under cross-examination from one of the, of actually one of Kyle Rittenhouse's old lawyers, incidentally, Davis admits that he lied to the police about why the group was upset with Nikolai Mu. Uh, this is just incredible footage. Watch this. You also said to the police, he came out of the bushes and he was taking pictures of the girls. Yes, I said that. You saw that? No, I said that. I, I understand you said it. Did you see it? Yes. So you saw Mr. Mew with his camera that afternoon taking pictures of little girls. That's what you're telling this jury. Oh, no, no, no. No, no that's what I said. No, I, like I said, I understand you said it. Is it true? Oh, I don't know. Why would you say it if you don't know if it's true? It was a lot going on. Um, okay. Now, it's hard to believe that this is a real interaction between two humans in a courtroom. So the lawyer says, you said you saw him taking pictures of little girls. Witness says, yeah, I said that. Lawyer says, did you see it? Witness says, no, I said it. Now, to be clear, we're talking about falsely accusing a man of pedophilia two years after the fact, and then uh, and the only excuse he can come up with for lying is there was a lot going on. There's a lot going on, so I just accused someone of being a pedophile. It's, you know, it's, 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 it just, just happens, and it's, things were hectic. Keep in mind, this is a prosecution witness. So this should be the end of the case right there. I mean, this is, this is the, the clearest possible evidence that the people Moo confronted decided long after the fact to come up with a story to justify their aggression towards him. They have no credibility whatsoever. You'll remember in the video, uh, somebody shouted that Mu was looking for a girl, but on cross-examination, another witness, Jawan Cockfield, admitted that the claim was not based on any evidence whatsoever. Watch. You tell the police that he told you he's looking for a snorkel, yes? Yes. Okay. And you then say, grown man can't have sex with little girls. What the hell? What the f***? He's a raper. Right? Uh-huh. Yes? Yes. Okay. You have no information as to what this older man is doing, do you? No. Okay. <clears throat> I'm a raper and saying he can't have sex with little girls. You're doing that to humiliate him, aren't you? Not necessarily. Well, what other reason would you be calling him names when you don't know anything about what's happening? Trying to figure out the situation. So the way that you're trying to figure out what's happening is by calling a grown man names. Yes? Yes. Hmm. I mean, part of the problem here for the prosecution is you have witnesses whose IQs are not much higher than, like, the chairs they're sitting on. Uh, so, you know, they just called this man a raper who's interested in little girls as a way of scoping out the situation. 
Yeah, that's what they're saying. That, that was their way of gathering intel, apparently. Trying to figure out what was going on. So, you know, when you're trying to figure out what's going on, the best way to do that is just to accuse everyone of being rapists. That's, uh, you know, you, you start with that and then you kind of uh, whittle things down from there. And then elsewhere in the testimony, Cockfield claims to be shocked that the man in response turned around and became upset. Now, none of this makes any sense. And as the trial went on, it continued to make no sense. For example, on cross-examination, it was revealed that the dead teenager's best friend, Owen Peliquin, told police on the day of the incident that Moo was looking for a lost phone, not underage girls. Listen to the defense attorney read Owen's prior statement and then watch as Owen tries to weasel out of this admission. Watch. Your answer. We were floating... And then we look at him, and he was just standing completely by himself with some goggles on. And then we were like, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I'm looking for a phone. Do you remember providing that answer to that question? Not at all. Is that true? Very true. That happened? No. That didn't happen? I do not remember. You don't remember what happened that day in the river? Well, I remember. So did he or did he not tell you that he was looking for a phone i don't recall him ever saying that no okay is your memory better today or is it better on the day of the incident i'd say it's better today it's better today almost two years later yes yeah i've been able to think about it a lot okay well in between the time of the incident and today do you ever reach back out to law enforcement to make any corrections that you might have had no i'm pretty young i wouldn't have known how to do that okay still one uh i I mean you know if there wasn't a dead person here and someone else's life hanging in the balance you'd you'd almost have to laugh at some of this it it seems almost like a courtroom like a very dark courtroom comedy uh just the the these witnesses so two years later um owen's memory is suddenly better it's better now than it was at the time. He, he remembers more about what happened two years later than he did when it actually happened. And by that, he means his memory is worse because he can't, he can't, he doesn't remember if his memory is good or not. That's, that's part of the problem. He says his memory is, he doesn't remember. He doesn't remember. He's, he's not sure. He doesn't, he doesn't remember remembering. And now he doesn't recall the guy ever saying anything about missing a phone. And he had no way of figuring out how to tell the police any of this because he's just 19 years old. And 19 year olds are apparently completely unable to use Google or cell phones or dial 911 or communicate basic ideas at all, evidently. These are strange lapses in the prosecution's case, to say the least, and uh, it keeps going. Owen also testifies that he simply can't remember the fact that uh, one of his friends was shouting for the culture to egg on a fight. Watch. I wouldn't say we ever did it just for like a camera, like a video. Well, do you remember him yelling for the culture? Remember that? I do not. You don't remember him yelling that? I don't. Okay. Do you remember somebody in your group yelling or saying to somebody, you got 10 seconds? Remember that? I don't recall that. Did you say that? I did not. Okay. So Mr. Mew moves over to the blonde. Hmm. You agree there's a path to go through, but you want to see this through, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, I admit I'm not as hip as I used to be. Well, I was never hip, let's be honest. I had to look this one up because, uh, because you know, I, I don't know. So I, I went to Urban Dictionary, and you'll find that uh, for the culture is, quote, when you do something you know you usually wouldn't have done and are doing it purely for the hype factor of going against your usual judgment to instead try something new and different. And this is what one of the witnesses was shouting, and we heard that in the video. They were shouting as the mob descended on this 52-year-old man. When you want the best tickets at any sporting event or concert, you have to act quickly or someone else will get it instead. Similarly, if you're hiring for your business, you want to find the most talented people for your open roles before the competition scoops them up. The best way to do that is with ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter helps you find the qualified candidates and find them fast. And right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Walsh. Immediately after you post your job, ZipRecruiter's smart technology shows you qualified people for that role. Once you've reviewed your list of qualified candidates, you can swiftly invite your top choices to apply. This streamlined process encourages them to apply sooner, allowing you to fill that role faster. Amp up your hiring performance with ZipRecruiter and find the best talent fast. See why four to five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Walsh and try it for free. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash Walsh. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. 
Now, this is the kind of fact that if you're trying to make Nikolai Mew out to be the aggressor, if you're trying to make him out to be this uh, uh, dangerous man that was that, that his, these poor teenagers were, were, were so frightened by him, well, this kind of fact is, is pretty inconvenient. The fact that they're all laughing and having a great time and shouting for the culture, not exactly what you would expect if they were terrified for their very lives. So Owen just pretends that he doesn't remember it happening. Problem solved, according to the prosecutors. These kinds of inconsistencies are continuing to pile up as the trial goes along. But a few facts were definitively established. And one is that, contrary to what some of those teenagers said, Moo never knocked a woman down at any point during this altercation. She was captured on the recording, standing upright, holding her phone. Additionally, Moo never stabbed anyone until he was in the water, surrounded by a mob that was punching him in the face. So Moo waited until his life was in danger before he used deadly force. And once he began stabbing people, he didn't indiscriminately start swinging. Instead, he only targeted the people who were targeting him, including Isaac Schumann, who put his hands on Moo's neck. Watch. You watched the video, right? Yes. Okay. So now you're aware that Isaac has his hands around Mr. Mew's throat? I didn't know that he had his hands around his throat, no. You didn't see that? No. Okay. Is that something that you saw? No. That, he was, he was, uh, that was pretty late. That was, I think Isaac was the last one stabbed on video. And so by that time I was focused on the guy next to me who was, had his whole stomach cut open. Okay, but I guess my point is, initially you say you didn't see Isaac make contact with yep. him. You see on that video somebody with their hands around Mr. Muse's throat, right? Yeah. Okay. On that video, nobody is stabbed until Mr. Mew is punched in the face and knocked in the water, right? You After, agree with that? Yeah. Okay. And so you would agree that the people that are injured with the knife, that all happens after Mr. Bu has been knocked in the water, punched, slapped, pushed, right? Yes. Okay. And you don't, um, you don't attack Mr. Bu, do you? No. Okay. And he doesn't do anything to you, does he? No. Now, it's not an exaggeration to say that the prosecution has not presented a single witness to bolster its claim that this was first-degree murder. Instead, every single witness rebutted their argument. So here, for example, is another witness, A.J. Martin, who concedes that ganging up on a man in his 50s and beating him may, in fact, not exactly de-escalate an already tense situation. Watch. You're pushing him, correct? Yeah, I, that's where I had said that I thought I'd push him in the front left shoulder to keep him down, but I was there too late, so I didn't get that shoulder. I guess I got the back of it, and... You said you're a peacemaker, right? You like to mediate? Yeah, right? that's what I was trying to do. You could understand how somebody who'd been down in the water and hit two times, getting pushed from behind, may not understand that you're trying to mediate. Yeah. Goes to his mindset. Overruled. Yeah. You can answer the question if you're able to. Sorry, what was the question? Sure. Here? As a, somebody who likes to mediate and was attempting to mediate, you can understand how a person in Mr. Mew's position who'd been hit twice in the water might not understand or appreciate your intent to try to de-escalate by pushing him in the behind. I guess. Might misunderstand that, right? He, he could misunderstand that. Sure. But. Okay, so, uh, so far, thanks to the prosecution witnesses, we have established the following facts. Um, most of their witnesses are liars. It was completely reasonable for this 50-year-old man to fear for his life. One of the teenagers had his hand on this man's throat while the others were pummeling him. And that they all lied about him being a pedophile two years after the fact. So, like, what are we doing here? There's, there's no case. This, this, this man should be at home living his life. There's, there's nothing to even talk about. And this is not exactly the kind of case that it takes Perry Mason to win. But, but somehow, once again, things got worse for the prosecution. Yet another witness claimed that the group was afraid of Nikolai Mew, but began to feel a little more secure as other adults began surrounding him as well. So he's presenting this image of a deranged 50-year-old man who's freaking them out. Uh, and then the defense attorney shows a photo of the witnesses looking extremely enthusiastic and not remotely afraid. Watch. You see Mr. Mew walking away from your group, moving over toward the blonde person, the woman, right? Yes. Okay. And at that point, are you still 
scared? Uh, when more people, adults, start to come, I, I felt a little bit more secure. Okay. That's you, right? Yes. Okay. And this is, if you remember, seconds before, you, moments before Madison Cohen, you say you see her punched, right? This is before um, I saw her get punched, yeah. Okay. I mean, again, if, if not for the context, you, you, you have to laugh at some of that. that he's, he's claiming that he was fear, fearful for his life, and then you cut to a photo of him looking the happiest he's probably ever been in his life. I mean, this is, that's, that's, the, man, that's the, 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 the face of a man, uh, you know, caught on one of those cameras at, at a Six Flags, uh, uh, you know, roller coaster or something. This, that's not the face of someone who's fear, fearing for their very lives. Um, that is uh, certainly not someone who's, you know, grateful and relieved that other adults have uh, appeared to deal with the threat. And everyone looking at the footage knows that. So this is yet another prosecution witness who is lying overtly on the stand. Everybody knows it. And I could go on for another hour dissecting every other aspect of this case and how totally disastrous it's been for the prosecution. But you get the point. In no sane country is this a first degree murder case. And by the way, uh, there is no duty to retreat in Wisconsin. But even if there were, there was no real chance for this man to get away once the mob descended on him. This is a completely unjustifiable prosecution, no matter how you look at it. And it was brought for the same reason that most other self-defense claims are brought, which is to terrorize the rest of the population into submission. Remember how the Rittenhouse prosecutor said, everybody takes a beating now and then? Well, we're pretty close to the prosecutors in this case saying the same thing. That's more or less their argument at this point, that the 52-year-old men should just accept their mob beatings rather than defend themselves. You know, if you're getting descended upon by a mob and they're knocking you to the river and beating you and they have their hands around your throat, well, you know, it's just, just deal with it. Just lie there, play dead until they walk away. But that is obviously outrageous. In a sane society, if you harass and assault someone, whatever happens next, whatever violence erupts as a result of your choices is your fault. If you don't want to get shot or stabbed, if you, want to, if you don't want to bleed to death in a river, don't go around trying to bully random strangers just for fun. The reason this case isn't on every mainstream channel is that the mob happened to be white for the most part, though not totally. But this is every bit as serious and coordinated an attack on the right to self-defense as the Rittenhouse case, were, case was and the Zimmerman trial was. The judge should dismiss the charges. The prosecutors should be disbarred, and new prosecutors should consider looking into perjury charges for some of these witnesses who, again, have admitted that they lied. And if none of that happens, and if somehow the jury convicts, then we can say with certainty that just a couple of years after the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, the right of self-defense has been suspended in the state of Wisconsin. Everyone living there should either move or prepare accordingly. And the rest of us should do everything we can to preserve our fundamental rights while we still have them. If you'd like to see what else I have to say, you can access my full show by going to dailywire.com or by going to the Matt Wall Show Twitter page. Hope to see you there. Godspeed.